in most models, uh, this is all homogeneous and elastic, and um, you're starting out very simply. Um, if material is, is delivered from below into that reservoir, uh, what we get is a uh, pressure buildup and displacement of the host rock that can manifest itself as surface displacement. And uh, once the magma makes it actually to the surface uh, and it forms magma uh, lava flows, uh, some of that or all of it, all of that surface displacement may go away. Um, as a geodesist, I have a few tools at my disposal to actually go out and, and measure that. As I said, my, my favorite tool for that is uh, using GPS. Uh, there are satellite um, methods to, to get a surface displacement, which give you uh, lower precision but higher spatial resolution. Uh, those are some of those trails. But what we do is we, we try to take those um, surface deformations uh, and link them to um, to source characteristics of the of the source of the magma reservoir through, say, analytical models or um, more recently um, physics-based models to learn something about uh, the shape, the depth, and say the volume change of of the plumbing system of the of the volcano. And the reason we are doing this is primarily, of course, has a mitigation. You know, we want to know how much material is available that can erupt. Um, we just talked about Hecla volcano, which hasn't been erupting, and um, it's breaking its uh, basically 10-year cycle. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, the, the deformation there in Iceland continues. Um, so uh, the, the depth of the reservoir gives, gives us kind of a pre-warning time. You know, how long is it going to take for the magma to make it to the surface? And um, and then uh, the, the general character of the eruptions uh, will tell us whether or not um, the aircraft are going to be affected. You, know, you don't want to have a, a jetliner or jet engines in general go into ash plumes because they, the engines clog up and then you are free falling, which <coughs> actually has happened several times. Um, the next motivation here is the impact on climate, or really what's between climate and weather you know, on, a, on a short time scale. If you think about big explosive eruptions, uh, they can send uh, small particles all the way up into the stratosphere, and that's where you don't have any weather. So uh, your normal processes of rain and snow uh, can't clean out this material. And if, it, if there is enough of that, incoming sunlight can actually um, be blocked uh, by these particles. So you, all your warmth ends up somewhere in the stratosphere uh, or, or is um, reflected away. Uh, and you can end up with things that are you know, the years without, without a summer that has happened in historic times where you have crop failures and maybe snowfall in the summer, um, a big impact on your society. So if the politicians would actually li uh, listen to, to scientists, uh, you could prepare for these things and um, if, if you know that there are volcanoes that, that might prepare to do such things. And lastly, more on the basic uh, science uh, side is that uh, volcanoes uh, provide insight into <coughs> tectonics and mantle processes, right? They are really a product of these uh, global scale processes. So by understanding what's happening on volcanoes, uh, we can understand much better <coughs> how, how the, um, these global processes are, are linked up. Okay. So this is a map view of my study region. Uh, the photo I showed before was taken from about here. This is at the flanks of Zimina volcano, which is also extinct. Uh, we saw Bezimiani, Carmen, and Kluchiskoi. All of this is just slightly, slightly south of where the, um, the Aleutians uh, ran into, uh, into the Kamchatka Peninsula, which is in the Russian Far East. Um, so south of the Aleutians, we have a subduction zone environment, north of it, uh, more a uh, passive margin or a transform fault. Uh, Sergei Fedotov and others published this very complex figure uh, that is their <coughs> understanding of the entire climate <coughs> system of that region. <coughs> I will focus in only on uh, Bezimiani, Kamen, and Kluchisko idea. So what they use for, for the entire picture is eruptive products, uh, mainly seismicity, to, um, to, to get at the character of these sources. 
what they derive from deep seismicity is a source of some shape under Kluge's pi that branches off uh, towards something at mid crust le uh, levels at under Be uh, Besignani, and then uh, something more shallow under under Kluge's pi. Where's the Moho in this area? Uh, the Moho is um, at about 40, maybe a little below. So what we did there was, uh, from the geodetic perspective, go out, uh, distribute a network of uh, eight continuous GPS stations um, that were supposed to give you uh, daily daily records of um, of the motion in that area, uh, and six in red here uh, campaign stations. So those are just benchmarks on the ground. We would go back um, every summer to re-measure those to, to get more um, information about long scale or long time scale processes. <coughs> and uh, during those field seasons, we also got to fix all of these continuous stations because there are bears there that are really attracted to anything that's new and they would smash your antennas and stations, there's snow damage. Um, <coughs> the interesting thing about Kamchatka is that there's a lot of research that can be done if the political environment is friendly to you. Um, it, as you can see here, those blue sites are the continuous stations that were available at the time. And with our network, we more than doubled the available number of continuous GPS. Um, considering that this is a very active region, uh, those volcanoes erupt much more frequently uh, than, say, volcanoes in the Aleutians. Um, you have you know, subduction happening. Uh, you have the central Kamchatka de uh, depression, which isn't very well understood. There's just a lot of work that can be done in Kamchatka if you can manage to uh, to work out political issues. Um, the the processes at Bezignani during the time that we were there were mainly um, fairly regular, one to two explosive eruptions per year, and there was you know, one one big explosion that's sending up uh, the plume to 15 or 18 kilometers, uh, and that was that. You know. Pyroplastic flow is associated with that, maybe a small lava flow that came uh, came down that, that um, new edifice. And so we were wondering whether or not the dynamics would actually be um, reflected in their formation data. So again, you know, what we are looking for are these inflation-deflation patterns that you see mostly at, um, at closed systems, so we don't have, uh, we actually have pressure buildup at, at open systems. Uh, you know, the gases can escape and you see much less, if any, of, of these inflation-deflation cycles. <coughs> and, and if we see anything in those data, can we refine the source models? Can we learn much more about the geometry, the depth um, of those models that I've shown before? So here are the data. Um, this is the vertical component of all the continuous GPS stations from 2005 to 2011. Um, those down here are about 40 kilometers away from um, from our uh, from the vent of Besignani, and these these vertical gray bars indicate times of the individual explosions. And what you can't see is any correlation between an explosion actually happening and uh, some measurable deformation. The uncertainties in these data are fairly low, I didn't plot them here, um, but they won't help us with that. So we don't really see, even at the closest site, which is here right at the saddle, it's about a kilometer away from the actual event, pretty much on the flanks of Besignani, you can't see anything in the vertical, and it's very similar for the horizontal too. Uh, I, I talk about this at length at the paper and hypothesize about very shallow things that we might be seeing up here, but really there's, there's not much to hold on to. What is there, though, is, I hope you can see that, is this um, you know, subsidence signal at, at pretty much all of the stations. You can <coughs> see this, this very regional trend of subsidence that seems to decay a little bit as you get, get farther away. So if we look at uh, the, the velocities, uh, so here I'm showing vertical velocity in, uh, in red and in blue, I show horizontal velocity. Uh, these are millimeters per year. Uh, you can see that 
around Besignani, you see this big signal uh, on the order of, say, 8 to 15 millimeters per year. Uh, and that decays away uh, to 40 kilometers away. We have maybe 3 to 4 millimeters per year of subsidence. And over here at ES1, that's 120 <coughs> kilometers away, we have 2 millimeters. Okay, so assuming that this subsidence is really uh, caused by only one process, that's a very long wavelength process uh, affecting a large region. And there are really only three things that could explain that. Uh, one would be interseismic strain buildup. Uh, we have this subduction zone right here that uh, Roland Bergman came up with the model using lots of campaign data. And what happens, or what the idea would be, is that if you have the Okotsk plate here, which is basically you know, the kind of continental section, uh, and the Pacific plate, um, the Pacific plate subducts underneath the Okotsk plate, uh, those plates are locked. And, and as the Pacific plate subducts, you get um, subsidence closer to the trench and uplift farther away. That's a classic deformation uh, earthquake cycle. Okay, in, a, in an earthquake, this strain gets released and you get the opposing um, polarity. You get uplift near the trench and subsidence farther away. So the question is whether the locking is deep enough uh, that we can actually see that subsidence uh, out in, um, in our network. And you know, taking Bergman's model, forward modeling things, uh, the vertical is really uh, negligible. There's a lot of horizontal contribution that I eliminated here by giving things re relative to ES1. Um, but yeah, so, so that doesn't explain what we see. Uh, the, the other option would be surface loading. Okay? Um, if you think about this, mm -hmm. this volcanic cluster, it's fairly young. Uh, Kluchesko is about um, 7,000 years old, Besignani maybe 1,000 years. Uh, and, and these are huge loads that are being built up, just lava flow after lava flow on top of one another. So do we see some isostatic adjustment? Ductile material in the crust, maybe even down in the mantle, although the, the wavelength is, is fairly small. Do we see uh, compensation due to that, which would be mainly in the, in the vertical component? Okay, Reconstructing the load history there very carefully uh, and conservatively and making assumptions about uh, the elastic and, and viscous properties of the crust in that region that are, again, fairly conservative, I can explain only two to three millimeters per year of that. So that's non-negligible, but it's still only a fifth at most of the entire signal. So the last thing that remains is, of course, we are in a volcanic environment, uh, some deep source. And the character of that source has to explain something that gives us more vertical deformation than horizontal deformation. As you can see, the, the horizontal vectors here are fairly disorganized. Um, but uh, we, we have a network that's really made for a different problem, right? We are measuring something that has a large uh, regional effect where the network really was, was focused for Besignani. So we kind of just go ahead and do a formal inversion. It, whatever comes out of that is, is super non-unique. So um, what helps me here is the, the seismic record. Okay, uh, making some assumptions. Again, I have more vertical than horizontal deformation, so my source needs to be flat, right? A spherical source always has a big impact on, uh, on the horizontal, uh, a vertical uh, source much more so. So some sill-shaped uh, shape, um, um, source has to fit somehow um, into, that, into that region of seismicity. And I put a slightly dipping sill right underneath that, thinking that most of these uh, earthquakes may be caused by uh, fluids and, and gases, um, mainly fluids, percolating uh, through the crust there. Um, I, I, I get my, my dimensions out of the distribution of the, uh, of the earthquakes, uh, and, and here I have a map view of that sill that I just constrained by locality of earthquakes. So the sill is slightly dipping towards the subduction zone, it's at uh, 33 kilometers depth. And I can use now the vertical data, uh, the subsidence of my network to constrain the closing rate of that sill. Sorry, Ronnie, just to interrupt, what yeah. were the colors on the previous, your deep earthquakes, oh. were those? Oh, those are just, uh, 
earthquakes below 22 and a half kilometers. So okay. it's just a depth indicator, so you can pick them out. And are those all high frequency earthquakes, or do you have LPs? Uh, those are all high frequency, I believe. And how do you constrain the dip of your seal? Why not an horizontal dip, just from the seismicity, or just this here? Yeah, yeah. So, so I made the assumption that those earthquakes are uh, due to material coming from a source moving upwards. Really, the sill could also be in here. Yeah. Uh, it's just one assumption I made, and I, I walked through that, and uh, things seem to work well. But yeah, the error bars on this here would be huge. But so there, there is no tectonic bars. features or seismic data no. that allow you to. Okay. No, it's only the seismic data. Mm -hmm. And all the seismic data and other um, later done uh, tomography uh, work show that yes, there is material from that general region moving up through the crust, and um, and that's as much as we as we know so far. But I would not, I would not vouch for it has to be at 33 and a half kilometers depth. You know, it could be at 25 and a half or something like that. But it has to be deep. Okay. So, so using the vertical data, I can constrain the closing rate for this sill, and it turns out to be 22 um, centimeters per year, uh, which results in uh, 0.03 or so cubic kilometers per year of volume loss over the five-year um, cycle or uh, observation period. So here I'm plotting in black the forward model, uh, the, the vertical, and in white the, the model horizontal data. Um, of the model results on top of the actual data. And over here I show the residuals. So this is um, you know, model uh, data minus model. And you can see that most of the red is within a data uncertainty or disappears. So we can explain quite a bit of the, um, of the subsidence away by um, these externally constrained um, source. The other thing that comes out is that the, uh, the horizontal motion seems a little better organized now. It seems to be, this is all given with respect to this station up here now, but at least for, um, for this network, uh, th there might be some, some southward uh, rotation maybe around that station. There are big strike slip faults uh, kind of bordering the uh, central Kamchatka de depression, so it might not be totally unrealistic to assume some, uh, some block rotation. Uh, but we're not going there, right? As I said, there are lots of assumptions in all of this. Uh, we're really stretching the limits of the network that I have, uh, but we can use this really nicely as um, reason to go back and do a lot of more work to explain the regional tectonics. So to, uh, to summarize that first part, I have a magnetic source um, that constantly discharges material from about 30 kilometers depth. The volume change fits really nicely within long-term uh, eruption rates um, for, for the entire region that get out of um, derived. And uh, yes, the network is too uh, localized to do, to do much more. So in the future, I'd like to collaborate with somebody in Japan, Takahashi Hiroaki, who has been doing quite a bit of um, tilt level um, work around Pluchaskoi. And he wants to go uh, basically put out a, a GPS transect from the Pacific into central Kamchatka to start uh, taking apart the tectonic versus uh, volcanic uh, deformation partitioning. Uh, and, and I want to focus, um, you know, add on to that, uh, focus more on, on what happens around that sill in the northern part of the central Kamchatka depression. Real quick, yes. before you move on, is there a reason you're not using inside? Mm. Yes, many people have tried. <laughs> but the, it's it's too regional. You can only use summer data. It's there aren't enough observations, and um, and the signal that is so regional tends to blend in with uh, atmospheric uh, dis um, yeah dis disturbances. So uh, there were several groups who have tried. There was a paper out in GSA, I think, in the early two thousands, of Pritchard and Simonses. Uh, they did their sweep throughout the world, and they didn't see anything in, in Kamchatka. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there may not have been anything, but maybe there has been. It's just not been so well, hard. You said that's a Pentatops rate is a long term rate. What do you mean by long term rate compared to your observation? Um, 
really long term. I forget the actual uh, records, but it includes all the big eruptions like the 1975 uh, Tolbachik event and the, uh, you know, obviously then the, the Besignani eruption in 56. But I think that's kind of where it stops, but I'm blanking on the number here. Um, Say that again? Is there not an estimate of how much has come out during the observation period and does that compare with the uh, there, there, is, there is an estimate and it falls also nicely in that, in that range. Uh, so, so yeah, and, and so right now what, what happened last year was that Tolbachik started erupting <coughs> and for, for a while now, so Tolbachik is a little bit to the southwest of this area um, and, uh, and Besimiani hasn't been doing anything. So there is some, you know, on-wavy evidence that these guys are all linked to, to something uh, that, that might actually be what we are seeing here, but uh, I'm not going to vouch for that either. Uh, what is, what's the temperature of the volcano? <laughs> I have to blank on the number here. Um, it comes out of liquid, but it's not as solid. Uh, well, well, some of it, so, so what, if you go back here, yeah, so, so those are those are uh, fairly viscous flows that, that do come out of uh, out of Pesignani. It's not basaltic; uh, it's more anesthetic material coming out there. And are those those explosions or those uh, volcanic events, fragmentation events? Um, the ones you have those lines on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any any more questions about? This. Just one, if you're incurring a volume change, it means you're not restocking from below. Um, well, we see in that volume change, so there might be fresh material coming in, and we are only s and, and more is going out, and some of that might be stored in the <coughs> crust. Um, but but we don't, we can't resolve any of that, and we only uh, see the net volume change. We don't really know the total volume of things coming in and out. Okay. But gravity would be a, a, one of the things that, that should be done. And um, I, I put that on my, on my to-do list. <laughs> OK, uh, the, the next part is moving on to Alaska, um, Redout Volcano, which is 160 kilometers southwest of Anchorage here, um, marked with the red triangle. Uh, there was an eruption in 2009. and. Um, the GPS network there is very different. It's mainly a monitoring network. There was one uh, one station, a continuous site, part of the Plate Boundary Observatory, uh, that has been there since 2006. But these red dots, they were only put out just before the explosive activity started. Uh, they are campaign stations. Luckily enough, they were re-measured in 2008 uh, after a period of seven, seven years or so of no measurements. So this was all really lucky that we got anything out of uh, out of that eruption, really. Um, the, the event itself lasted from about March 23rd till April 4th and was explosive. So the character there was uh, you had a dome that was built and then um, then there was, you know, erupted away and then another dome that came and a few uh, explosions associated with that. And then uh, that stopped uh, and after April uh, 5th, you know, the the last effusive phase was really just the last dome that, were, uh, that was being built, and um, there wasn't enough left to, uh, to cause another explosion. Uh, the effect was that about, a well, hundreds of flights had to be rerouted or canceled. Right? Anchorage is a, is a fairly big international airport. Um, lots of cargo goes through there. And there's oil production, which, uh, you know, there's an oil storage terminal right here at the mouth of that valley, which I hope you can make out. This is where all the lahars go down. So that was actually built during an active event at, at Rito, and I forget, I think that was in the 70s. Um, so, so that had to be closed too, which, which is an issue. Uh, my <coughs> question here, or what I'm going to be talking about, is not the evolution of, um, of the actual plumbing system. You know, that would be fairly similar to what I did at, uh, at Besignani. It is interesting. I invite you to read the paper. Um, it's actually pretty cool with um, you know, mid-crustal accumulation and then reactivation of, of uh, residual material from the 
maybe 9 eruption, but I'm going to be uh, looking into what happens during these 19 explosions, right? There are, there are a few GPS that are fairly close to the vent. So my question there was whether or not I can see pre-explosive pressure buildup, you know, some, some inflation effect, and then, and then co-explosive um, subsidence. And uh, I'll be showing you data from AC17, which is right here, uh, and, and uh, RBBM is going to be given relative to this. So we have 30 second receiver uh, sampling rate, so we can do uh, sub daily positioning. There it is. Uh, this is uh, the vertical east and north component of RBBM given with respect to AC17 uh, for all of April 4th. So this is the last day of explosive activity. And you can see here a very nice peak source. Okay, so what happened there is uh, there's AC17 over here and RBBM is over here. And we can see that um, RBBM move, moves up west and south with respect to, uh, to AC-17. So it's a lengthening of the baseline. And the, the volcano is in between those stations. So it, it really nicely gives you an idea that you know, there could be that, that kind of inflation happening and then things erupt and you get deflation. And <laughs> But this hypothesis gets screwed up when you plot the actual onset of explosive activity, which is that vertical gray bar. So, you know, that's kind of cause and effect reverse. You would, you would not expect an inflation following the onset of explosive activity, especially not at that amplitude, right? So these are 60 centimeters that we're seeing here. That's a, that's a lot around any volcano, especially for a short transient event like that. It does happen consistently, though. So, uh, so, so, so this is uh, March 23rd through uh, April 5th. Uh, in the previous figure, I just showed you this peak over here. And we can see these, these peaks associated with all of the, or many of the explosive events really. <coughs> uh, but what also happens at the same time is that our, um, our RMS, or our, our, um, phase residuals, or better, our misfit of the GPS model to the satellite observation peaks a lot. So all these observations don't, or all these positioning results don't seem to fit the observations from the satellite very well. So there, there is the idea that um, volcanic plumes, ash plumes that is, not mantle plumes of sorts, uh, can show up in the phase residuals. And that was put forward by Nicolas Hollier in uh, 2005, we saw that for Mount St. Helens and the Akajima volcano. And um, to, to get you caught up into that, I thought I'd give a little bit GPS 101 here. Um, so we have, we have our receiver here uh, that gets a data from satellites. And the receiver uh, records a few things, and one of which is the, phases of the, uh, is the phase of the incoming, uh, incoming uh, signal. Uh, in GPS processing software, we use the phase uh, to invert for quite a few parameters that ultimately give us our position, okay? So we have those model parameters uh, that we can then use to forward model the expected phase that comes from all of these satellites, and then we can, we can subtract one from the other and we get a phase residual, which basically gives us the quality of our parameters, okay? During all of that, we make an assumption about what the atmosphere is. Okay, so there's a radio signal coming from a satellite that goes through um, wet parts of the atmosphere, or the atmosphere could be wet. Now water vapor, or water is a dipole, and it has an effect on radio signals, right? Uh, so if, um, if that radio signal goes through clouds or fog or something like that, it gets refracted, uh, which ends up uh, in, a, in a longer um, signal path. Okay, now when our volcano starts erupting, uh, it effectively violates our assumptions that we made about the atmosphere, right? Uh, it's not just water vapor anymore, there's a lot of water vapor, there's ash, there's, uh, there are electrically charged particles, and all of those introduce an additional phase <coughs> delay, which effectively means that our signal takes longer to make it to the station. Okay, for the GPS processing software, it doesn't know anything about the plume. This means that you know, our station is right here and it thinks that maybe the satellite is further away. 
but the satellite is constrained by precise orbits. So really, we map this into the position of our station. And, and this is exactly what we saw here. And if I now go ahead and I show you the sky view, so this is our station looking up. Um, all of these lines are the trajectories of the, uh, of the satellites um, that we can take from the orbits. And along these, I plot the phase residuals, again, you know, the mystery. And you can see here, if I plot this from 1400 to 1440, which is the time of explosive activity, there's a, there's a large peak uh, for a satellite uh, that is uh, exactly between, uh, or the signal has to go exactly through, through the plume that erupted. If I uh, show you the same figure for, for the base station here, so this is processed a little differently. Uh, you can see there's much less noise. There's a little bit of a blip here that really is mapped from here to there. Um, but the overall level of noise is a lot lower. And this really is kind of background noise that we would see over at this other station too. Now here's the footprint of the plume. Uh, so our GPS station is really close to the dense part of the plume. Again, satellite 10 was over here, so the signal goes right through the plume. AC-17 has a much more dispersed view of the plume. We know already that you know, um, plumes that have been detached from the, from the volcano and been in the atmosphere for uh, a few hours don't have any effect on, um, on our, our GPS signal. So, so this is likely what we're seeing right here. Now to prove that further, I can just delete the data from this uh, satellite 10 here, this, this red section, and reinvert from my position which I'm doing here with the blue line. And you can see that big spike is just going away. There's still a little bit of noise. Uh, but what may have been interpreted as an actual offset that is you know, pro-eruptive inflation deflation really turns out to be just a, a, an artifact noise that now can be exploited as, in sig uh, as a signal to do something about uh, volcanic plumes. The reason why I care about this is a figure that's fairly old but it demonstrates uh, air traffic from North America to Southeast Asia and back. And it shows all of the volcanoes in Japan, the Kurals, Kamchatka, the Aleutian Islands, and the Alaska Peninsula, that all of these aircraft, you know, thousands of people every day, uh, fly over. Now, I'm not advocating that, that we should have GPS on all of this and do our plume detection just with, with GPS, but some of those volcanoes do have GPS. Uh, and and it, is a, it is a really nice um, tool that just falls out of standard processing. Uh, and the other thing is that while remote sensing does a tremendously great job detecting plumes, it has the issue of, so far, a fairly poor temporal resolution. Now, even geostationary satellites take about 25 minutes to uh, acquire a picture and uh, transmit it at fairly low spatial resolution. If you think about volcanoes like, say, Cleveland in the Aleutians, um, you know, all the action may be over when the satellite's coming, coming back. And right now, another tool to detect explosions um, is infrasound that works really well. But even that has several hours of delay uh, because of the uh, travel time of sound waves. Uh, so yeah, this is a really nice tool that, as I say, uh, is just a byproduct of standard processing. Uh, we get our azimuths right away. It's complementary to remote sensing. At, at readout, we uh, found 17 or 17 plumes were about 12 kilometers, uh, and of these, we detected uh, 12, uh, no false positives, and the, the non-detections were just due to a poor geometry. Right? You, you need to have your satellite, your plume, and your station just in the right configuration to have any penetration of the plume by the signal, and sometimes that just doesn't happen. Okay, now the big question that I always get at this point is, so can you use this for composition of the plume? And the answer is we don't know quite yet, but I'd like to try. So, um, but that needs an atmospheric scientist of sorts, because I, w I know way too little about aerosols and their effect on, on waves. I'm, I'm really keen to, to get into it, but help would be great. Um, and the question really is whether or not we can use these phase residuals and also signal to noise ratio, which Christine Larson has been working on after, um, uh, after my paper on, on readout, uh, which basically gives you, um, you know, a first order estimate of ash concentration maybe, 
uh, due to reflection of, of the signal. Um, to, to characterize the composition of the plume, here I mean water versus solid materials and, and get an ash concentration because that's what's interesting to the airline industry. They want to know how much ash is potentially in a, in a unit volume of air, can we fly through that or not? So there are big tests that are now being done, you know, what that, what that level is, but there need to be field measurements and, and this might be a just good addition. Uh, there's going to be, uh, there are really good data from AFATIRCO in uh, 2010, highway GPS, nice webcam uh, images uh, to, to experiment with. Uh, and there's the data from 2012 at, at Weapon, which also uh, put up quite a show, actually, in, uh, in 2011. So I think I'm, I'm going to mention this briefly. Um, I hope I'm not going to run out of time at the end, but this is really cool stuff. So this is um, using, using GPS differently to get at plume heights. And this was work that was led by the, by the Icelanders, mainly uh, Sigrun and my stuff here. Uh, but I got involved in it, and it's just super cool. So this is the Vatnerko ice cap in um, southeastern or eastern Iceland. And there is a, a subglacial um, volcano underneath, which is called Grimsvatn. You can see here the, the outline of the caldera. Uh, the vent of that eruption was about was here where the red star is, uh, and uh, there is a nunata, a bedrock sticking out of the ice about six kilometers to the east of that vent. Uh, and they they put high rate GPS there, seismometers, um, a tilt meter, and and um, and this is transmitted uh, by a radio link uh, down to here and all the data could be recovered throughout that eruption. So that's fantastic. You know, the plume went up to, what, 18 kilometers or so. It was a big, violent thing, uh, but they got all the data, which is great. And there are a few more high rate stations around the, uh, around the ice cap. What they also had was visual observations of the height of the plume, uh, and here we are showing um, you know, the first three days of the eruption. <coughs> so there were uh, photos that were taken that, uh, can very neatly constrain the, the rise of the initial plume. Uh, there was X-band and C-band radar. Of course, those have uh, discrete scanning intervals that depend on the distance uh, to the volcano. But if you take the average, you get this, uh, you know, this pulsating um, red line here, which indicates, as I said, pulsating uh, plume behavior, but an overall decline uh, in, in height of the plume. OK, and here's the stuff that you can ask me later about, I'm just going to look into that briefly. Uh, we know from the interruptive period uh, that there's a really nice inflation signal. Okay? The station is moving away from the source, which, which is believed to be uh, about here, so quite a ways away from the actual event. Okay. Um, so, so during the eruption, uh, that polarity uh, inverses and, and we get motion towards that source. So we know where the source is, making the assumption it's a simple Mogi source, a you know, spherical thing, uh, very shallow, two kilometers depth. Uh, making an assumption that the radius of that doesn't change, we know that the, the rate change in displacement towards that source is um, basically constraining the change in pressure in that source. Okay, but we make the assumption that the radius stays the same. Good. So we have the pressure change rate. When we link that source through uh, a simple laminar flow conduit to our vent, uh, we can get through um, flow equations um, a magma flux at the vent. And then there are uh, relationships for, uh, those are empirically derived from looking at, at many, many explosions uh, and plumes um, that relate flux at the vent to the height of the plume. Okay, so again, we constrain the radius of the source, uh, then our deformation rate gives us the change in pressure rate, which gives us uh, the flux at the vent, which gives us the height of the plume. We also assume that there is no volatile uh, content change in the magma and no recharge. So we simplify a lot, but when we do this, we get this black curve here, okay? We, oh. Of course, we also have to use the first 30 minutes here to, um, to basically, everything has been normalized to, uh, to initialize all of these normalized parameters uh, to, to the observations. But then we get this, we, from the deformation record, okay, 
we can, we can reconstruct or forecast uh, the height of the plume. We get the pulsating behavior, right, and we get the, um, uh, the, 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 the decay over time also, right, which is pretty cool. If we have these external observations uh, and we forecast this and, you know, this doesn't match anymore, we know instantly that there's some uh, fundamental change in the plumbing system or in the composition of the magma. So I just wanted to mention that briefly. I can, I can go over that in, in a lot more detail uh, after the talk. Because the last thing I really want to talk about is earthquake early warning, which is what I'm doing right now for my postdoc. Really integrating real-time GPS into earthquake early warning. And uh, the thing you need to know about this, early warning means that earthquake is happening, and you have P waves and S waves that radiate outwards. Okay, we are not doing forecasting or anything like that. Uh, we have an earthquake that's happening, P waves are picked up by the seismometers, uh, we use relationships that uh, give us the magnitude from those P waves, uh, and then we try to send out an alarm uh, to as many places as possible before the S wave, the shear wave arrives, which really causes the destruction. The reason we are doing this is because we want to get you to personal safety. So the surgeon should take the uh, knife away from your eye. <laughs> and you should do the standard thing that stuck cover and hold on uh, during an earthquake and get yourself just, you know, a few seconds of warning is really enough. When I talk to people about what's scary about earthquakes is they come out of nowhere. You know, if you're good, you can kind of hear the, the P wave come. but. You know, there could be a magnitude 9 coming right now, probably not here, but somewhere, and, and nobody would know about it. There's automated control. The Japanese benefited highly from their uh, early warning during the uh, Chohoku earthquake in 2011 because all the bullet trains were slowed down or stopped. So there were no derailments. It was a magnitude 9 earthquake, but nobody died in a train. Uh, and BART is doing the same thing, so when you go to AGU, you can, you know, feel a little better about being on the bar. They're <laughs> slowing down their trains now based on our alarms. And you also want to get your, pers uh, your, your first responders out of those, those grid buildings so that your fire trucks aren't buried um, under, the, under those bricks. The status right now is that we have, uh, we have a demonstration system that is operational right now that is mainly um, seismically based. Uh, there are 400 seismic stations. California is complicated, so there are you know, four networks. And, but everybody is nice to one another, and we get one statewide system. So Berkeley and the USGS, Caltech work on that together. Uh, ETH is involved. It's funded by the Moore Foundation and through USGS. And it's really, you know, it's working. The issue, of course, is uh, station density. Right now, we work with what we have. Um, but uh, there was a law put in place in September of last year where Governor Jerry Brown demands uh, that there shall be uh, earthquake early warning for the state of California by 2016. He wasn't nice enough to give us the money right away, so you know there's that catch. Uh, but now the California Office of Emergency Management or Services uh, is tasked to, to find the money that it would take to increase sensor density and get a system actually running. And it's going to work because most of those politicians, I, I'm on a tangent here, but that's OK. Um, <laughs> the, those, those politicians, um, they voted for it unanimously. right? This was last year. Remember government shutdown and all of that? None of the uh, Republicans or Democrats in California disagreed with the need for earthquake early warning because it's a really hot topic, you don't want to be the guy that's responsible for no warning system, right? So, uh, so we are in a really pretty good position here. Okay, now the reason we want to increase or include earthquake uh, GPS into earthquake early warning, again, comes out of the Tohoku earthquake. This red line here traces the, the uh, magnitude that was derived just from seismic data. And as many of you probably know, uh, that saturated at a 7.9 and um, Many papers have since been published. This is run by uh, Tim Wright that show very nicely that if you actually use static offset or dynamic motion um, that comes from high rate GPS, uh, you don't saturate that low. You know, this particular paper uh, predicted a or derived the magnitude of, uh, I think, 8.8 .8 or something like that. So even the, the, initial, um, the initial estimates that are always going to be later than uh, just seismically derived uh, 
magnitude because we have to wait till the S wave comes, it gives us static offsets. Um, but those are already higher than the initial estimates that came from, from uh, seismology. Okay, so would there be some difference in the reaction, like in an early warning system, between a magnitude 8 and a magnitude 9 earthquake? What do you mean, reaction? Does it matter if you know it's 8 or 9 for an early warning, warning system? Would the bar trains, I mean? Yes, I will show that right here. I okay. hope I can demonstrate that. I want to show right now with this movie here. Uh, the difference, what does it mean in terms of surface displacement, what a magnitude 9 is versus, it, versus a magnitude 7.1. And let's see if I can start it again. Okay, there it goes. So here we have horizontal displacements, here we have vertical displacements. Those are 1 hertz obser observations. Um, this is the onset, this is the event. You can see how things start sliding. The maximum is 4 meters in the horizontal, 60 centimeters in the vertical. You can see S waves come through, you can see the surface waves roll through, and you can see that a lot of Japan is affected by this. Uh, there's some really nice reverberations, probably due to sediment basins. The coast was uh, subsided by about 60 centimeters, which increases the tsunami hazard, right? All of a sudden, the wave has to be much shorter. This is the first aftershock, magnitude 7.9 by Tokyo. Mm. And this is what you get. You know, so having them superimposed on, on, on one another gives you a really nice idea of what it means. What does an order of magnitude mean in, in, in the earthquake world? Uh, what the Japanese did was, um, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to do that. They, they only warned the region that they thought, which was generous for magnitude 8, um, that was affected by, um, by that earthquake. And so the region was too, sh too small, Tokyo didn't get a warning. Um, so so if, you, if you have some spatial constraints on that, the magnitude really matters. Okay, so uh, the, the thing that I'm building is called GLARMS. Uh, it's based on the seismic algorithms that feed into that common decision module. So each of these detect P waves and tell somebody here, hey, I found an earthquake, and, and that somebody here is, is the final uh, decider uh, about whether or not an alarm should be sent out to the public. Uh, on the GPS side, we have uh, time series that are being generated, and, and there's my, my code that takes in position time series, or position changes. It does continuous quality control on the last five minutes of real-time data. Um, Okay, if triggered by the seismic system, so uh, again, I said that a GPS cannot detect P waves, right? It's not precise enough, and it's not its job. Seismometers are really good at, at finding P waves. So we hook ours, uh, this algorithm uh, to the P wave detection uh, and start estimating offsets when a P wave is detected. Send these offsets into um, an inversion module that uh, gives us a distributed slip model and from that the magnitude and sends that back into, into that public system so that once the seismic system initially decides that there is an alarm and um, it may end up saturating and say a six and a half or something like that, we can kick in and say, no, it's really a seven and a half. Uh, and, and that decision, <coughs> it's okay to make that decision a little later because you will initially warn everybody already. So you have a few more seconds to to, to increase your warning radius if you, if you have to. To show that this works, I replay the El Mayor Kukapa earthquake data. So this was in, uh, in northern Mexico. Here's the uh, US-Mexican border. We only have observation, really good high rate observations from the northern part here, from the southern US. Uh, what is showing, shown in these panels here are just the north and the uh, the east displacement along uh, a few of these baselines. And they show you that there is you know, dynamic shaping, but you can also make out the, uh, the, the static offset from this, which is what we are estimating. <coughs> okay, so um, now this is running through in, in simulated real time. And uh, these black crosses here are the estimated offsets at, at each epoch. 
uh, once we think an S wave would actually arrive. And as these offsets start, start to increase, you can see that there's slip that's building up on our model fault. Uh, the magnitude increases from uh, background and noise towards a magnitude 7 here. Yeah, it's about a magnitude 7. Uh, static displacements didn't arrive until about um, 34 or so seconds after the event because, again, the S-wave has to travel from here all the way up here before we actually see any deformation, which takes 30 seconds, obviously. Uh, the, the actual final magnitude was a 7.2, and we, uh, we consider our solution fairly good and fairly stable. Uh, all these colors here just mean uh, micro-strain, so strain that's propagating through the network. And so you can see that there's some noise, right? It's real-time data or simulated real-time. Some of these things go off and on. Uh, but in general, there's quite a nice um, visualization of the strain. Now, the one thing I want to point out that you hopefully saw is that the strain built, or this, excuse me, slip built up really gradually. Okay, I'm do only doing <coughs> spatial, spatial smoothing here. There's no smoothing in time. At each epoch, I re-invert for slip along that fault uh, and um, so, so that really tells us that the, um, the offset estimation is, is very stable. Okay, to, to summarize that part, uh, right now GLONGS runs in real-time testing mode at the BSL, and you may have heard that there was a 6.9 offshore of Northern California a few days ago, and um, our network isn't far enough reaching, and also the code had crashed just a few hours before because <laughs> it's real-time testing mode, right? We are running this right now to actually uh, make it stable and work, uh, hopefully for the next bigger earthquake that's actually um, where people are. Uh, it's going to soon feed into the demo system, and things uh, appear to be robust. In the future, I'd like to expand that for volcano early warning. The, the, uh, the colleagues in Iceland were fairly interested in that. You know, you can do the same thing. You just swap out the greens functions that give you uh, that that link your your surface def deformation to your to your sources. Uh, there would need to be another trigger algorithm. Probably, I can implement some short-term average, long-term average. Uh, on that. Uh, the code itself is going to be open for other observatories, so if anybody wants to use it, it's highly modular, uh, nicely developed software, uh, so that we don't have to replicate all of these efforts. And, and in the future, there's a lot of work that, that can be done. And inspired by Google, I, I thought I'd include this here. You know, really what we need is um, real-time seafloor geodesy. Okay? I'm just going to put this out there, and I call it a moonshot because it really is. Right now, we are with C4 Geodesy, about where we were with land-based geodesy 30 years ago. UNAFCO was founded. UNAFCO is a big instrument pool for geodesists 30 years ago because a receiver basically had to have its own truck <laughs> to be put out into, into the field. It was too expensive for any individual institution. Um, but for the Tohoku event, what really helped were those few seafloor observations that they had, about five. And they have 1,200 land-based observations. But those five data points were way more important to constrain the distribution of slip on the plate interface than, than, than many of these land-based things. So that's something I want to get uh, involved in and uh, hopefully push forward uh, over part of my career. So to summarize the entire thing, um, or all the things that I talked about. I, I went from uh, daily positions at Besimiani Volcano constraining you know, uh, a, a deep source, a deep sill that is more hypothesis right now than, than actual evidence, but provides a lot of uh, material to go back and work on. I went to uh, sub-daily GPS to detect volcanic plumes with that. Uh, I used high-rate GPS, or I contributed to uh, the use of high-rate uh, GPS for plume height detection. And right now, I'm using real-time GPS uh, for a regular one. So it's a nice mix of applied versus basic science that, that I have been doing and will continue to do. And uh, with that, I'm ready to take more questions. Thank you. part of the talk there. Um, is depth uh, of the break important in that modeling? And if so, how do you handle that? It is very important. Um, so, so you mean the depth of the slip? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if we, we get the most offset of, 
at the surface if the fault actually ruptures at the surface. If we have a, a, a deep, very deep slip, you know, say there was a magnitude 8 uh, off in Kamchatka last year, we, we see very, very little uh, surface offset on the order, so that was 600 kilometers, that's kind of depth I'm talking about here. We saw about a centimeter of offset at the surface. And that's nothing you can resolve in real time. But it's also really not a hazard for you in real time if things are so deep. Uh, but yeah, there is a trade-off. And uh, right now, for California, we can make the assumption uh, that it's very likely to rupture the surface or that the rupture is going to be large enough that we can, uh, that we can, um, we can resolve the slip. And uh, making the assumptions of surface rupture uh, does not bias our models too much. But yeah, we, we simplify there. And that may overestimate or underestimate the magnitude. It would underestimate the magnitude. How soon can you tell the size from an earthquake in your earthquake early warning system? Yeah, so um, I'm not going to go back. Uh, so, so you saw there was this. Um, this figure that showed seismic magnitude versus GPS derived magnitude. Okay, so it depends on how soon, how far our GPS away from uh, from the epicenter, um, and you know the main reason there there's an issue is the S wave propagation time. So if we are as we were in, uh, in El Mayor or in uh, Mexico, about 200 or so kilometers away, it takes about 30 seconds. Uh, and then the processing itself is, you know, there is some delay that's due to uh, data transmission. So you have telemetry delays. That's on the order of hopefully a second or two um, that can be hardened with, uh, with the money that's available. Uh, and then there's some processing time. The GPS time series, each epoch is actually processed in less than a second. So there's no delay, uh, really no delay uh, for one hertz uh, observations due to that. And then my inversions are uh, being constrained right now. Uh, I, I got them to within a second too. So once, I, once the data is there, things pop out really quickly. So there might be maybe four or so s seconds just due to, due to processing. But we are within, uh, within the tens of seconds. Right. So uh, <coughs> considering the uh, March 11th earthquake, How soon can, could you have told uh, whether the earthquake size was eight or nine? Um, okay, so just going to go back to the bigger power because it shows it really nice. Okay, so so you can see that here, at about thirty-four seconds or so after the event, uh, S wave started making it on shore, and then we started just from the static offset from one station, uh, you could actually already estimate uh, you know, that it was a magnitude, uh, what is that, more than seven and a half. But then there's also finite rupture time, okay? So the rupture isn't over yet. The rupture actually took about 150 seconds for that event. So you're already pretty well within the ballpark, uh, but in that animation that I showed, you saw that uh, you know, the horizontals, they it took some time to, to evolve towards the final position. And that was the physical process, not the processing itself. Um, so the, this here shows it fairly nicely that you know, about for a big earthquake like that, uh, you get to the final magnitude for GPS within, say, 100 seconds or so of the onset of the rupture. Uh, so, but you already know that something big is happening and you just update your, your system. Okay. Well, 120 seconds is far better than 20 minutes. Yes, yes. As you, so yeah, as you point out, it took 20 minutes for, uh, for waves to get far enough away uh, to decay in amplitude uh, that it was, that was uh, possible to constrain the final magnitude. And that's when your tsunami is already well on the way. So it's not just the seismic hazard. In Japan, the, the big issue really was the tsunami. If you put a magnitude eight uh, into your seafloor deformation model, your, your wave heights are going to be way too low for that, to your, your uh, inundation area. But would the GPS data actually be able to tell you whether you're generating a tsunami or not? Uh, 
to some degree. Um, so if you see, like we saw in Japan, that your coast is subsiding and you have a big megathrust earthquake, you know that the seafloor has to go up somewhere. You, you don't know what the actual amplitude is, but you know for magnitude 9 and all that subsidence on the coast, there's a lot of energy that has to go into the, into the tsunami. And all, of the, um, all of the tsunami modeling um, uh, software or codes really uh, just take the seismic magnitude as an input and make their own assumptions about how the seafloor deforms. I assume that, uh, especially early on with your GPS map, and maybe even more than that, you must be, I guess, using the uh, seismically constrained hypersimmon information yes. and so on. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, we are. And um, <coughs> and actually, more so, we are. So, sorry, so once you know where that is, <laughs> at least in this case, you've got a pretty good idea what the mechanism is going to be. Right. So some of those, some of those deep, uh, some of those stations that show things got me really excited, yeah. and then uh, the Russians showed me how they were installed, and they were on rooftops that had snow accumulation <laughs> under the antenna <laughs> in winter, and so we just thought that it might just be coincidence that the eruptions happen at the same time as huh. these stations. Does it look like the farthest one? I forget. It, it, yeah, I don't want to make you yeah. scroll, but the yeah. lowest one, it seemed to have things going on. It seemed to have things going on, so yeah, you obviously uh, but I, I saw the figure, and what they say is there's wind packed snow under the antenna that actually tilts the antenna. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's a bad monument, so you cannot really, I refuse to, uh, yeah. if there's not another observation due to that, yeah, it is a shame. I sat there, the grad student, in my cubicle, I was like, hooray, you know, yeah. scientific evidence for great things happening and <laughs> then yeah, I got, yeah, bad yeah. Okay. Right. I was curious, why were you not seeing any inflation and deflation if you're having these big eruptions there? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it is a, it is a, it's also an open system that you know that constantly degasses. So you just you, you may not get that uh, that pressure buildup just because the way uh, the the plumbing system is set up, which is a shame. Other questions for Ronnie? Okay, let's thank him once again. Thank you.